Well, a good morning to every one of you, uh, all those online and here at Bryanston. Good to see your beautiful faces and uh, just aware of God's love and life and presence here with us and uh, on this wonderful uh, long weekend. And uh, just pray, God, your just will, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in South Africa as it is in heaven. Lord, as there's voting happening tomorrow, Lord, we just pray for peaceful and fair elections. And Lord, that your will would be done in and through your kingdom and through your church and through this beloved land, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Just wanna ask for your grace this morning. You know, we have values in New Life Church and we call them le, the Lelouge, Lelouge values. L for loving, lovers of God, lovers of people. We also love ourselves. A for being authentic and real. Uh, L for being life-giving. We always wanna be encouraging. And U for unifying. G for being generous in our hearts and our minds. And then also, we always wanna uh, allow there to be a spirit of excellence in all that we do. And that uh, doesn't just apply the way we do our services to our children's ministry, our students' ministry, our adult services, but also just the way we as new lifers live under His grace. And so the A in Lelouge, uh, Lelouge means a sled, by the way. It's a, um, like a, a snow, a sled going through the snow. Um, but the A is for authentic and being real. So I'm gonna ask for your grace. I'm gonna be real with you this morning. Uh, when I got here this morning, I tweaked my back slightly. And so I'd said to Freddie and the team, hey guys, listen, if I'm not gonna be able to stand on this stage, we're gonna have to go another flow. And, uh, but by God's grace, I'm standing here. And uh, so if I start, uh, start uh, praying in tongues or start doing something weird, just, I've said they can just drop the lights and we'll just start worshiping, hallelujah. Everyone with me? Okay. I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, series uh, called Home. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a documentary series that offers viewers a never before seen look inside some of the world's most innovative homes. And every uh, episode uh, unveils the imagination of these people that dared to have a dream and build these unique special homes. And every one of them is so special. I mean, you've never seen a, a home design like that. An interesting show. And I believe that the Lord is calling uh, His church also to create never before seen homes. Uh, in terms of its design and in light of what happens in and through the home, because every home is imperfect, we all works in progress, but I believe the Lord wants to do something unique in you and me. And when we're talking about homes, we're not just talking about where we live. It could be a room, it could be a house, whatever it is, we're also referring to your realm of influence, the people you've touched, also referring to your relationships. Uh, as well as your business, whether you're studying, working, wherever it may be. And I believe the Lord wants us to have a new breed. It's a new breed homes, a different design, never before seen homes, that even though homes have been under an onslaught and an attack, that there is a restorative, redemptive part of God that wants to work in people that will say, Lord, I wanna welcome your glory. I wanna welcome your presence uh, where I work, study, and live. And so we can open uh, our, our hearts to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in each one of us. And so that's why I've called today New Breed Homes. That there's something about when God's glory is in a room, when God's glory is in a bo boardroom, when God's glory is in a house, uh, in a relationship, people recognize it, they sense it, they think, wait, there's something that I'm drawn to. They're being drawn to something weighty uh, in the sense of God's glory, His kabod, His presence. i never forget years ago, I had the privilege of going to a, what they call a school of pastoral nurture, uh, headed up by Pastor Jack Hayford, who I've regarded as a very dear mentor to, in my life. Uh, he has uh, mentored mil uh, thousands of pastors and pastored a church called Church in the Way in Los Angeles, California. And every year, what he would do is he invite pastors from around the world to come sit with him as he would just begin to share some of the lessons and principles that he's applied in leading a healthy, beautiful church. And so as a young senior pastor, uh, I would go there uh, at least four or five times over five, six years, and I was just like a sponge as I just listened to the insight and revelation he would share on what it was to be uh, a church that is uh, 
inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in the world. And I remember at different times, I would stay in some of the members' homes. And uh, these were committed members of church on the way. It was based, as I say, in Los Angeles, California. And I remember as I'd stay in these people's homes, I was just so conscious of their humility. I remember the specific couple, uh, two professionals, a big home, uh, living in a very classy part of uh, Los Angeles. And yet when I would talk with them and we'd eat together, I was just so conscious of their humility, their hunger for God, uh, as well as their servant-hearted leadership. They, were, if they, had, they had every right to be arrogant because of the um, accomplishments they had made to high professionals, and one, he specifically was high in Hollywood, movie industry and all that stuff. But when I'd sit with them, I was just so conscious, firstly, of God's presence, His glory there, and just the fact that they were so natural, they were so authentic, they didn't have to appear spiritual, but they just begin to, to share some of the stories that were happening where, where, they, where they lived and where they worked. And there was a natural, supernatural DNA within each one of them. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, what I'm seeing here in this church as a pastor, I'd love firstly to see in myself as well as see it in our precious church, New Life. These people, it was like a new breed. It was, there was a different DNA, uh, God's glory moving through just people who were just available to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. They didn't have to pretend, they didn't have to try and act spiritual, they just were naturally supernatural. God was moving in and through them. And that's my prayer for all of us, that your home, whether you're a single person or family, whatever it is, that people would see that there's a different DNA, there's something different and we are drawn to it. You may not be perfect, but we are drawn to something that you are, are, are inviting and entertaining in your own home, and, and it's God's glory and presence. And so I know this, that God is committed to doing something um, in you beyond your wildest imagination. He's really committed to something, just like those, those designers, those visionaries around these unique, innovative homes, that God has something beyond even your imagination if we will just open our hearts to his work in us. And I believe that wherever you are, whether you're not liking where you are or you're not necessarily liking the season you're going through, wherever you are, that you wouldn't think small. That you wouldn't think small for you would understand that the Lord is preparing you and me to do a great work. That we would not allow the circumstances of our life to limit us and not to think small because sometimes we can feel trapped by various experiences and events and just limit what God wants to do. And God's saying, I don't want you to think small. Don't get in the way. I'm doing a great work in you and it's gonna exceed your own imagination. But something happens when we begin to embrace this, that when the Lord's beginning to do something in you, and maybe you're feeling stretched, and maybe you're feeling, wow, God, this is, it's bigger than I can imagine, and Lord, the, the circumstances, Lord, when the Lord's beginning to increase his work in each of us, it's so that he might release more of his life through us, begin to release more of his love, his presence in our homes, in our families, in our sphere of influence, in our relationships, our business dealings, and that he's committed to each one of you to fill you with his spirit that you can begin to do things that you could never do in your own might, your own ability. And so I believe to welcome the visitation of God's glory in whatever circumstance, a mess, whatever it is, in our situation, I believe we need to reshape our thinking in these days. We cannot think like the world system thinks. We're gonna say, God, I'm a kingdom person. Lord, your kingdom is in me, the spirit of God, and I need to be filled with your spirit. And there's certain things I need to begin to do to nurture the glory and God's presence so that I can be more productive, more, more fruitful than ever before. And so when Jesus comes, he says, he says something, he says the words, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. My rule, my reign is at hand. And he says, what I'm wanting you to do is I'm wanting you to reshape your thinking. There's another word for reshaping our thinking, changing your mind, is repent. And sometimes repent, we just think, well, it just speaks of remorse. No, it's actually just reshaping my direction, reshaping my thinking. 
He says, because listen, I'm wanting to begin to think differently, church, because my life, my reign, my rulership, my presence is at hand. It's available and, and wants to work in and through you and your circumstances. And so through this series, and we're gonna be, God willing, ending the series uh, next week, and by God's grace, we will talk about certain things that you and I need to know before you're ever gonna make a move, a move to another suburb, even in a job situation, et cetera. Certain things we can see from the Word of God, certain things we need to do before you ever decide to move. And, uh, but we've said in this series that God wants to visit your house, my house, and all the different things that it refers to, but it's gonna look, God's looking for a people that'll be worshipers. Not worshipers of ourselves, not worshipers of the creation, but worshipers of the Creator. God Almighty, worshiping Him, and there's something about worship that God inhabits the praise of His people, His God's glory visits our homes. And so worship is foundational. And I just wanna briefly share three essential uh, principles that I believe also help in the release of God's glory presence into our lives. And uh, they're principles that can be applied uh, by anyone and everyone. And in one sense, they define what a new breed of Christian looks like, a new breed house, a house, your business, your home, your relationships. And they apply to all professions, whether you're an attorney, a clerk, a physician, a gardener, a, stay, a house mom, house dad, whatever, or a student, whatever your role, these are principles that I believe can apply to every one of us. And I believe if we'll begin to lean into them and just say, God, by your grace, help me apply these, I believe we'll begin to see God's glory manifested through us. And what will happen is you'll begin to view yourself, as ordinary as you may see yourself, you begin to see yourself and view yourself differently in a new way because you'll begin to see that Jesus is just beginning to happen through you in your own natural way. You don't have to get hopped up about something, but that you can just be available, natural and available and led by the Holy Spirit and Jesus can begin to move in and through you and me on a daily basis as we make a difference in this world. And the first one is this, and it seems so simple, but I believe part of our mission and our mandate as the body of Christ in these days and is what the world really needs is God's love. That we are called to extend God's love naturally. Extending the love of God to others. That doesn't need to be something that we're gonna harp up or that it needs to come from a place of guilt, but that it can become a natural, comfortable lifestyle for every one of us, and listen, there's some hard people to love. And sometimes, sometimes the hardest person to love is sometimes ourselves, some people that have hurt us. And so, but I believe God wants us to understand that your highest aim is that we would grow in love. Love for God first, love for others, and also love ourselves. And that God, if you think about it, something that defines who God is, is love. That He is love and that we are made in His image and God wants to help us grow in love. And it's the sign of a real mature person is, is a person that knows how to love. And I believe that the greatest need in the world today, mankind's greatest need is to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. To know that God's love is available. Because when you know that you are loved unconditionally and you are secure in that relationship with the Father, I tell you, it, it, it creates a new confidence, a new peace, a new joy. And so um, people wanna know God's glory, they wanna know the love of God, and so what we are called as people, as Christians in this world, on this planet, with all its unique challenges, with all its beauty, but all its challenges, all the evil in the world, et cetera, that I believe we are called as new breed people, new breed homes, that we are part of our mission, apart from knowing God, worshiping God, knowing God, doing mighty exploits, is to begin to extend God's love to others naturally. And, you know, in the past, I've grown up in the church world since a little guy, and, you know, the way we would share the gospel of God's love generally was through church services, and that still is a key way that we share God's love, and there would times be moving altar calls that would persuade people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to know how much God loves them beautiful moments. And then also, there was a side of us as Christians, we kind of felt that we, no matter what conversation uh, we were having, um, that you kind of always had to gear the conversation towards witnessing. 
that you had to have a planned strategy and how am I gonna lead this person to Jesus? So no matter where you were, you had to kind of make sure that conversation was moving in that direction. Never forget once I was at Virgin Active Gym, well those days I didn't call it Virgin Active, it was up in Bryant Park, and I was just feeling so under pressure, I thought, you know, I'm in this gym and I need to make sure that I'm sharing the gospel. And I remember I was in the change room and this guy's standing there and I thought, all right, I better tell him that God loves him. And I just looked at him and I said, sir, just so you know, God loves you. And he looked at me and I just walked straight out. I didn't know what else to do. I just walked straight out and just said, God loves you. And I thank you. I thought, I hope the Lord used that moment of obedience. But sometimes, and then we'd go door to door. We'd have these clipboards and we'd, part of our mission was to try and share the gospel to every person in the ramberg Bryanston area. And so we'd every, almost every day go knock on doors. And um, things became a little bit difficult over time. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had a measure of effectiveness as some people would open to uh, us coming to their home and, and sharing the love of God with them. And, you know, so there, there was nothing wrong with these different ways where we could extend the love of God to people. Nothing wrong with it. But I, I wonder for quite a few of us who've maybe known the Lord for some time, we know that we're called to be effective witnesses, but sometimes a, a, it, it, was a, it was a guilt-induced lifestyle. There was a part where I just felt if I was with anybody, I, I had to now share the gospel. And, uh, but I believe there's a more maybe balanced concept or principle for us that we can begin to extend the love of God naturally. And it happens this way when we begin to perceive, perceive ourselves more naturally as just Jesus' representative where you work, study, and live. That I'm part of Jesus' kingdom. I'm part of Jesus' family. And he's put me in this place. Even though it might be a challenging place, he's put me here as his representative. And I'm just gonna begin to see myself as his representative. And so it doesn't have to be a guilt-driven life that where I am, I'm gonna be sowing seeds. I'm just gonna serve and love Jesus. I'm gonna serve people, pray for people. And I'm gonna do whatever or minister to people as the Holy Spirit prompts me in different ways. And that could be through conversation, serving someone, acts of service, whatever it is. But I'm just gonna be naturally supernatural available, extending God's love. If you think about Jesus, um, he did not simply commission us just to go and tell people to get saved. His mission was also broader. Listen to what he says in Luke chapter four, verse 18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now this is huge for all of us because we're gonna see this in a few moments why every one of us, if we have a revelation that the spirit of the Lord has anointed you, he's upon you, he's anointing you for a reason. Jesus says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me, he's empowered me to preach the gospel to the poor. In other words, to share good news to the poor, not just poor in financial means, poor in spirit, that we all need to come to a place where we need a savior, we need a Lord. He says he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives that speak speaking freedom, it was so beautiful. There was a freedom course done this weekend. People who came along, and he did a phenomenal job. It's people understanding that Jesus called us to freedom. And that recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so here Jesus' approach was now shaping, mentoring his disciples for them just to be spiritually ready, not to be worked up, but to be spiritually ready. There's a fervency and hunger for, to love people, to love God, to love people, but just to love people in the middle of their need. And this was part of Jesus' commission. Hey, go out and heal the brokenhearted. Those who are feeling oppression, depressed, whatever it is by different circumstances, go along and just be an agent, a representative of Jesus to share his love, his life, his presence, his power with them. Also being sensitive to those who have a, an openness, a human hunger for God's love, that we're aware, that we know sometimes when people are on transition or trouble that they, hey, their radars is up. Even yesterday, be honest with you, I can't say that I like this Halloween event, and uh, you know, and I'm, I could say a lot in and around this, but what it does show me is just that there is, even in our younger generation, there's a hunger, believe it or not, for the spirit world. What they don't realize is that they're actually hungering for the Spirit of God, they're hungering for Jesus. They're wanting something real that's more powerful than any demonic spirit out there. That's what the hunger, that's what our young people really want today is the love and presence of Jesus. 
But here Jesus is preparing kingdom people who understand who they are, that they're part of the living church, part of his living kingdom, and that how they can be exactly that, and that they can move into everyday circumstances just to be naturally supernatural. That's my prayer for us, naturally supernatural. And what do we mean by that? That you're just available to the Holy Spirit's direction and enablement that he loves you, he's in you, he's teaching you, he's empowering you. Sometimes when you're tired and weary, his strength comes in those moments and inspires you, empowers you to make a difference in this world. And so extending God's love to people needs to be a natural, comfortable lifestyle. That's the one principle that we need to grab hold of to be new breed homes, new breed people. But a second thing that I believe also helps us begin to live this lifestyle of love and his power and his presence is understanding the meaning of the word kingdom. Understanding the meaning of the kingdom is understood. This is when this lifestyle begins to open clearly to us, that I can now become an agent of God's love and life. And when Jesus came to earth, he preached and use this word kingdom many, many times. You can look at in, in the gospels that, that he's preaching the kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. This was the heartbeat of the gospel, the good news that Jesus was saying that there's a new kingdom now that's present. And this kingdom is filled with righteousness, that you can be right standing with God, that you can be in a secure relationship with the Father, that you can have a peace that surpasses all understanding, that you can also understand what it is to have joy. In his presence, there's fullness of joy, that you can be an influencer in this world for his kingdom, that you can be invited into his kingdom. Unless one is born again, you cannot enter his kingdom, into his reign. Think of a king and his kingdom. But this king is full of righteousness. He's pure love, pure peace. And here he's saying, I've come to provide a kingdom for people to be invited into this eternal kingdom where you can have a king that begins to rule in reign in your life and mine, where sometimes our flesh or the enemy or different circumstances have tried to rule and reign in our lives. Now what we're doing is we're opening our heart, we're opening our minds, our heart, inviting Jesus the King to rule and reign. I'm now part of his kingdom, but I'm also called to extend his rule and reign to people that are open to his love. And so when we think of the word kingdom, I know this for many years, it kind of was a vague term, and sometimes we, we'd kind of see it as it just related to heaven, which it does, but it also just related to church work. We're helping build the kingdom. And uh, yet I believe it goes deeper than that because I believe when Jesus was talking about his kingdom, he was talking about there is a new reign. The King Jesus is coming to rule and reign in you, that you can have a transformation of your heart and your mind and your life, but that he wants his church And this, I believe, what he wants his church to grab hold of is that you are his authorized agents, that you are his representatives, that you are now part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's an eternal kingdom. The nations of this world, the kingdoms of this world being shaken, but this is an unshakable kingdom, and that you are now part of the secure kingdom that is something that is still to come in its entirety when Jesus returns, but the kingdom of God is in hand. It's within reach, and that you can now can begin to experience his kingdom, his life and his presence now as we begin to do business under his leadership and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just to briefly talk in and around the kingdom, just again, this is a brief overview, but when you think of kingdom, see rulership, see God reigning in his kingdom, king ruling and reigning. And the Bible makes two things very clear about God's rule throughout the universe. He is the king of the universe. That first he is created and almighty and no power transcends this. And we also looked at that a little bit briefly last week. He exceeds his own creation. And we could camp on that, that he is the sovereign ruler of the universe. Even universes that maybe we don't even know where that are there, he is the sovereign ruler and creator and almighty. Now what happens, and just in terms of planet Earth, here he creates everything, beautiful and powerful, speaking of his glory and his goodness, but he creates mankind, Adam and Eve, a human race in his image. And he delegates his rule to Adam and Eve, to mankind, to now rule, manage the planet. 
He hands them that rulership. They're in relationship with him. And out of this relationship, he says, okay, yes, he's the ultimate ruler, but what he says, I'm now delegating this dominion, this rule, and I'm wanting you to rule this in relationship with me. In Genesis, and says, then God blessed them. This is Adam and Eve. And God says to them, be fruitful and multiply. And I believe he calls us to do the same thing. He says, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, have rulership, leadership, rulership over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in Psalms, it says the heavens, even the heavens and the lords are the lords, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Now, so here you have Adam and Eve, they're walking in the cool of day with God, beautiful relationship, they're clothed in God's glory, there's no consciousness of sin, and then there's a temptation that comes, and they submit to uh, Satan's lies, who now try and move them away from God's relationship and tries to usurp their authority. Their authority. And so there's, in one sense, a double disaster that takes place to mankind in that moment. They, 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 they fall from their place of relationship with God. All of a sudden, their relationship with God that was one, all of a sudden, because of sin, sin separates us. There's a disconnect from their relationship with God, which was their source of security and acceptance and, and security and significance. And their place of rulership, they lose their place of rulership in managing the planet in one sense. And so they've lost the authority that God has given them over the earth. It's forfeited into, in one sense, into the hands of the enemy. And so it's in that moment, since that time, in one sense, and I know there's another aspect to this, but hear this, the rule of the world has been under the sway of what the Bible says, Satan the devil. J Jesus in scriptures will talk about, he is the God of this age. Scripture will also talk about the ruler of this world, Jesus said. That here in 1 John 5, it says, the whole world lies under the sway, the influence of the wicked one. Paul the apostle will talk about this present evil age. And we can see in the world today, there's lots of beauty, but there's also evil. And so Paul will speak in around this present evil age. And so what God created and, and, and said what was good is uh, was fund, it was not changed fundamentally, but in one sense it came under a rebellious ruler called Satan. And I know in these days it seems not politically to correct to talk about this, but we're gonna recognize the Bible says that Jesus said the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And so now the enemy in one sense rules and multiplies his ruin and destruction through principalities and different systems to pe move people away from the plans and purposes of God. But God is still at work and we'll see that now. And sometimes what people attribute to acts of God like uh, war and disaster and strife and bloodshed and broken lives and broken homes and uh, bodies uh, dying and all those things, sometimes those are the acts of God really are really the result of man's lost rule through disobedience and Satan's tactics uh, in bringing ruin and destruction. So herein lies the problem. But now God in his love for us sees us now disconnected in his glory and his grace and his mercy for us. He provides a way of escape. It provides a way of redemption and rescue. And now in comes Jesus, the King above all kings, the name above all names. And here he comes as Savior and King, and his mission in one sense is twofold, because he loves us, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Firstly, he comes in as the second Adam. Remember first Adam, our great, 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 great grandfather, he's the one, and he gets a bad rap sometimes for certain things, but we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But yet Jesus comes as the perfect second Adam. He comes to rescue mankind, and through his death and his resurrection to restore our relationship with the living God. And by rising again and overcoming sin and overcoming death, here yeah, he rises from the dead. Death could not keep him down because the wage of sin is death, not only spiritually, but also physically. He rises from dead, the dead, and he begins now the reinstatement of mankind to now become rulers in life under his reign. 
So not only does Jesus now, there's two things that were lost in the Garden of Eden, relationship and rulership. Through accepting Jesus, we now become part of his kingdom. Our relationship with God now is secure. Nothing can separate you from his love. You are now secure with God Almighty for all eternity because of what Jesus has done. But now he's also given you resources, his power and his presence for you now to begin to rule and reign in life. And that we are now placed on this earth to allow God's rule to be manifested where we work, study, and live. Yes, all works in progress, but that God's presence and power can rule and reign in your home. I can make a decision. I'm gonna allow God's rule to happen here, or I can allow the rule of the enemy or the rule of my own flesh. And the Bible says to sow to the flesh is to bring its own pain and destruction. Many of us know what the flesh can do. But here, Jesus is walking on earth and his ministry is demonstrating his rule entering the human scene. People are seeing miracles and and signs and wonders here. The the winds and the seas even obey his words. People are seeing miraculous provision and they're seeing, wow, who is this? They understand this is King Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's also helping fallen people to receive forgiveness and restoration and healing and freedom. He's calling people to forgiveness and they're beginning to see the evidence of this rule of his kingdom, the power of his kingdom. And so whenever people would receive his rule by acknowledging Jesus as Messiah, they would begin to sense a change happening on inside of them. And as they would begin to yield to Jesus' kingship, his rulership, they were beginning to open their heart to more of the blessings of his kingdom and their understanding of the king is here. Jesus told his disciples that he would die, that he would rise again. They also saw him living a perfect, sinless life, showing, him, showing us, hey, listen, we might not be perfect, but by his spirit and by his help, we can begin to try and live the Jesus life in loving a hurting world, bringing peace to anxious hearts, bringing life and, 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 and peace in, in his presence. And then what happens when he rises from the dead, all of a sudden the reality of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross transforms, changes the hearts and minds of the disciples. These timid people that now had seen Jesus at work, here they thought it was over when Jesus died. Now they see the resurrected Christ. They are filled with the boldness of God. They're filled with the anointing of God. They have a revelation that we are now part of His eternal kingdom and we've been put on this earth to extend the ministry of Jesus. The things that Jesus was doing on earth, Jesus is now calling us to begin to extend his kingdom, his rulership, his reign in people's lives. And when Jesus comes to rule and reign, that's where we sense righteousness. That's where we sense his peace. That's when we sense his joy, his love, his power. A new order was happening. And what Jesus said before he left, he said, now listen, What's gonna happen? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna rise from the dead. At first, they weren't really understanding what, why the cross was taking place because he had to save the sins of the world through his blood and his life. And Jesus says, then I'm gonna rise from the dead and I'm gonna send to the right hand of the Father. All authority has been given. I'm gonna overcome the power and the grip, the rulership that Satan has had over people's lives. So they're not, they're not gonna have to, people are not gonna have to fall prey to the work of the enemy because I'm giving you all authority as my people. All authority has been given to me head on earth and I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom and now you're gonna be able to walk where God has told you to move and live. And then he says, the Holy Spirit, he promised, he says, I'm giving you the Father's promise. I'm not gonna leave you alone. Someone is gonna come live in you, dwell in you. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater than these, he will do. Greater works, why? Because there's gonna be more of us on the earth. We representing Jesus, you're a Jesus person. You're letting Jesus happen in and through you. So more people, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper. So were you feeling helpless? He's saying, I'm giving you another helper that he may abide with you, dwell with you, dwell in your home with you forever. The spirit who the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. What a beautiful, precious promise. 
Jesus will also say this in Luke chapter 24. He'll say, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And so here he had the disciples. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's done everything necessary to bring about his rulership to our lives, his kingdom to be advanced. And yeah, he says, now wait, someone's gonna come. It's the precious Holy Spirit. He's part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God is gonna come dwell in you. Your, your heart's gonna be, you're gonna become a new creature. Your, his love, the love of God's gonna be shed abroad in your heart by the precious, powerful Holy Spirit. And then Jesus will begin to deepen the understanding. They weren't getting the fullness of it, but it all started falling into place. He said, I'm gonna build my church. That's speaking of you and, my, you and me. And the gates, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The rule of Satan doesn't have to rule over your life, your home, your marriage, your business. And he says, I'm gonna give you the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he says, this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, I'm gonna build you. I'm advancing my kingdom, my rulership. Wherever you are, you're being a representative of Jesus. You're authorized agents of my kingdom because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. You're opening your heart to the presence and the power. As you accepted Jesus, the Spirit of God comes in us. Listen to what Jesus said in Acts chapter one. He says, now this is, he's speaking to people at times would be so timid and, and intimidated by different circumstances, but they'd seen how the, when Jesus came, demon powers, even death, did not, could not hold them back. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses, you'll be my influences in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so what, on the day of Pentecost, about 50 days after the, the cross, the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus, this day of Pentecost, here, 120 Christians are in this upper room in Jerusalem, and guess what happens? As Jesus promised, they hear this wind, and the Spirit of God enters these sincere people who've acknowledged Jesus, and they are endued, they are empowered by the Spirit of God. All of a sudden, the promises, the prophecies, all the words that Jesus said, they're aware, they're aware that somebody is living on the inside of them, empowering them now to be agents of the kingdom and part of God's family forever. Now they're gonna be able to deal situations with the help, the power, the presence, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Peter, a person that had denied Jesus, and here on the, he receives the same Holy Spirit. He begins to do things that he would have never dreamed possible. Why? He had a revelation of who Jesus is. He had a revelation that he was now part of God's kingdom because of his grace, had the life and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and he began to boldly extend God's kingdom, began doing business by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe this is a beautiful picture for each one of us that we would understand that you're part of God's kingdom, part of his family, nothing can remove you from that and that you and I would understand that we have gifts and talents and that you're empowered by the same spirit in you to extend the life and the love and the power of Jesus to people that we interact with on a daily basis. And then when Jesus now is seated at the right hand of the Father, one day to return, and this speaks of his ultimate millennial kingdom where there'll be no suffering, pain, etc., no more death. What happened to Jesus is a picture of what ultimately will happen to us. But here he says, church, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. I'm wanting you to move in with authority. You don't have to be intimidated by the works of the enemy. And then part of Jesus's goal is to release your ministry and mine for us to be, to extend the ministry of Jesus on earth through your unique personality your unique gifts and talents. And that God says, I've given you power to do this. This is what Paul said. He said, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. So you are not helpless, that you have God's truth, the spirit of truth in you. You have his glory and he's gonna disciple and mentor and shape you and I to become all he's intended as we also understand that we can let the kingdom happen through us. So wherever you are, you can introduce his love into a moment that's maybe filled with strife. You can introduce his life to those that may be feeling so oppressed just by listening and being available to the prompting of the Holy Spirit that you'll let Jesus just happen through you. Each and every day, Lord, let Jesus happen through me. Yes, there's gonna be sometimes warfare. It doesn't mean we don't 
get sick at times. It doesn't mean we don't have the odd back issue. It doesn't mean that we don't go through trials. It doesn't mean that we don't sometimes get down and anxious and depressed. It doesn't mean that times we don't get tempted, afflicted, etc. Yes, these are those moments that we all go through. But as those moments, what they do is they shape us. Adversity shape us, but God is developing and He's more interested in who we're becoming and understanding the revelation that we are valuable to God, but also authorized agents of his kingdom, filled with authority and called to be kingdom people. And so understanding kingdom is a very important principle. I'm understanding your rule. Lord, I'm inviting your rule into my home right now. Lord, right now there's so much strife in the home. Lord, there's so much hatred. Lord, I'm inviting your love into this hurt. I'm inviting your love. Lord, right now, maybe there's so much unrighteousness in this situation or in this area. Lord, I'm praying. Lord, I'm inviting your rule of righteousness. Lord, I'm praying for your rule of justice to be manifest, to establish you. Lord, where there's so much fear and torment, Lord, I'm praying for your peace and your power to come, your rule. Because when Jesus is evident, when he's there, I tell you, you recognize the glory of God's there and he's in you by the precious Holy Spirit. And all we gotta do is open our hearts and just say, Lord, do your work in me. And then thirdly and finally, before we finish with a beautiful worship song, the fruit of this lifestyle of extending the love of God naturally, God's presence and power abounds only when a person opens to and lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this, receive the Holy Spirit. He said to the disciples, listen, I want you to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, listen, if you're a good father, wanna give good gifts to your children, how much more the Heavenly Father wants to give you the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in us. And I believe a new breed homes of people that have a revelation of the Godhead, they also have a revelation that the Spirit of God is in them and that you have someone who abides with you forever, that you're never alone. You're never alone. You got someone who's teaching you, helping, no matter where you go on this, on this planet, that you got the Spirit of God shaping you and helping you and glorifying Jesus in and through your life. And all we gotta do now is just be available every day. Say, Lord, today is a new day. Lord, use me in my unique way. Lord, I'm gonna respond to different situations. And when you begin to study the early church, you understand that these were people just empowered by the Spirit, welcoming the Holy Spirit, fresh and filling, saying, Holy Spirit, I've given out a lot this week. Lord, my, my soul's a bit weary, Lord. I, but now I'm just opening today, Lord, a fresh and filling. Fill me, Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Lord, there's a work that you're calling me to do today. Lord, strengthen me to do, Lord, things I could never do on my own. Fill me, Holy Spirit, I'm opening, Lord, just for a fresh and filling, just refreshing, restoring. Lord, that area of brokenness in my own soul, Lord, Lord, I'm praying that you begin to heal that. And then what happens, you begin to see how things just happen through the New Testament Christians. They didn't necessarily have a clear strategic plan to say, okay, today this is how we're gonna plot this area, this is how we're gonna strategize there. No, no, all they did, they were just open, like Peter, and John, there was a, a, a crippled man next to this temple called the Beautiful Gate. Every day he was asking for money and every day Peter and John would be going to the temple to pray. But one specific day, this, this man says, I need some money. And Peter and John look at this dear man, he says, silver and gold have I none. But such as, such as I have, give I unto you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And all of a sudden there's power and I'm not saying God heals everybody, but in that moment here, this man, the Bible says, he was healed and he was walking, leaping and praising God and began giving glory to Jesus. Peter and John, though, were just available to the Holy Spirit. They could just pray for this man. Philip, fleeing persecution, goes to a new region, Samaria, and all of a sudden he meets this politician and this politician is seeking God in his own way. And all of a sudden, Peter is using that moment to share the gospel of Jesus. And here a revival breaks out. But Peter, it's Philip in that moment, wasn't thinking, well, this is a strategic plan. No, Holy Spirit just said, go and talk to him. Just go and talk to him. And I wonder sometimes in our, our days, our, our, our interactions with people, whether it's through social media or in personal phone calls, in moments where sometimes the Spirit of God's just saying, just pray for that person or just, just spend a few moments just listening a little longer. And it's in that moment, the Holy Spirit setting up certain moments so that the love of God 
can be ministered to that person, that they can have a revelation of a God that so deeply loves them and wants to move in their heart, forgive them like He's forgiven me and so many of us and begin to rule and reign in their heart as He's ruling and reigning in us. And so Jesus, when you look at Him, look at the Gospels, He's ministering love, ministering joy, ministering life, ministering the glory of His kingdom in the most beautiful, practical ways. Ultimate saint, mixed with notorious sinners, flowed in spiritual power, but people were just drawn to his authenticity and his sincerity and his beauty and his power. It didn't have to be weird. He was just who he is. And we now part of his breed, part of his DNA. Yes, God's at work in all of us. But I tell you, if we'll just say, Holy Spirit, I'm welcoming you. Lord, begin to do a deeper work in me. Because remember, when God begins to do more work through you, He's gonna begin to do work in you as well because He wants to release more of His life and His love through us. And so let's not be a hindrance. Let's just say, God, let your spirit happen in me and through me. Let your kingdom flow, your kingdom of your rule of life and love and peace and joy. Can we just bow our heads just for a few moments? Can you just say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Refresh me. Fill me. Restore me. Empower me to do the things you've called me to do. Lord, give me a revelation that I'm your son and your daughter. I'm part of your forever family. I'm part of your kingdom where Jesus, you rule and reign. I don't have to be intimidated by the works of the enemy because you've given me authority, keys of the kingdom to advance your rule, your reign in my life, in my home, in my future. You abide with me forever. So Holy Spirit, I just ask, Lord, that you would just bring your glory right now just say, just say, Lord, I want my house to be filled with your glory. I want my life to be filled with your glory, filled with your presence. Lord, let me be a carrier of your glory to people on a daily basis. Lord, anoint my gifts and my talents, the purpose that you've called me to, to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm gonna ask us just to stand and let's worship the Lord and we just spend the next just a few more minutes and let the Holy Spirit just do something fresh just before we, we close.
Lift your voice and sing. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are.
promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are yes jesus we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are that is who you are We thank you, Jesus. I just want to remind you today that God knows exactly what is going on in your life today. Nothing hidden, nothing distorted. He's got 20-20 vision what's happening in our lives. And I truly believe that He will make a way where there seems to be no way. What a beautiful message by Pastor Chris today. And if you've never made Jesus a part of your life, if you've never invited Jesus into your heart and you're watching the stream today or you're here in church today and you say, you know what, I've heard about Jesus and I've wanted to make a, commi make a commitment, but I've just never crossed the line of faith. And today I want to invite you into this beautiful family of faith. And if you've never done so, why don't you just pray with us today? Let's all pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you were prepared to die on a cross for me, for my sin, for my shame, and my pain. Today, Lord, I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I invite you into my life, into my heart, into every part of my life. And I say, Lord, rule and reign in and through me. I belong to you, Lord Jesus. I am your child. I turn my back on the world and sin, and I thank you that I have a life full of hope in you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Will you give Jesus praise for every person who prayed that prayer this morning? Hallelujah. What a great Sunday. Thank you for joining us online. If you prayed that prayer today, we have want to connect with you. Your left, my right, under the gallery there. We, that's our next steps table. We'd love to connect with you. We have a gift for you as you start the spiritual journey with Jesus. And if you watched online, please go to our Get Connect section in the, on our website. We would love to connect with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. We will see you next week.